Maybe? Possibly? Okay, we're good here. Are we good on YouTube? We are, other than I need to fix the thumbnail to that. And we also want to put this under Shadows of Change and put it under Total War. And then we need to let people know that we're live. Uh, so we could do that. And while that's going, I can copy this and open that and open that live now to check out things in the wood the new short story about mother osinka so come enjoy uh, or come come join as i read and analyze this new lore Either here or yeah. I'm gonna copy all that and I'm gonna post it. And then I'm gonna go to Discord. And I'm gonna go here. And then I'm gonna go here. And I'm gonna do that everyone. And we're gonna post it again cool all right uh hello 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 um i still don't understand why this thing is you know what? i wonder if i could fix this real quick what is the properties of this uh can i get Okay, I think if I take this and I post that there, I think now it'll show YouTube and Twitch instead of just Twitch. So we'll see how that goes. Um, hello, hello, hello. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm going to get on some just chill background music. Actually, I guess we want some like semi creepy background music. That make it a little spooky, right? Can't make it too yeah, casual. Made a new units already. Go ahead and release that update early, yo. Dear. <laughs> uh, if only, if only. Um, okay, so we're gonna do. Um. Da, 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 da. Uh, okay, so ta 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 Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yep. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 How's everybody doing, by the way? How are you all? How's life? How you been? Are y'all excited for Thursday? It's gonna be a good time. I think a lot of I think everyone hopefully will be very, very excited for all of the goodies. Uh, hold on, let me send a message really quick. I 
I need some. I'm trying to think what's 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 a good like. Uh... Oh, this will seem perfect for the short story. Hello, 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 hello. Inquisitor underscore Hammond cheered. X100 sent you a DM after you finished talking to the old ones in your head. R.I.P. Trigen, best boy. Uh... Wow. Hammond, is this a friend of yours, or is this just, like, some random... Thing. So, uh, yeah, we got some Witcher stuff. Uh, I am going to mute sound alerts for this particular stream because I don't want people spamming annoying fucking sounds like the wah and the uh, peasant <laughs> noise when I'm trying to read a story. So uh, those are going to be paused um, and disabled for this particular stream. Um, actually, I'm just going to disable all the sound effects, and I'll just catch up with them when I uh, need to. Councilor, thank you for the 19 months, by the way. Um, all right, so, uh, today, this is not going to be a crazy long stream. Uh, this stream has a very explicit purpose, which is that we're going to be reading our way through the new Things in the Wood, uh, story that was written by David Geimer. Um... I was just going to make a video reacting and reading and analyzing it, but thought, eh, screw it. We can make a, uh, we can make an article, um, uh, we, or make, we can make a live stream out of it so that we can chat about it immediately afterwards. Um, and I will leave this one up on the YouTube channel. So for anyone that didn't get to see the entire thing or just missed it entirely and wanted to catch up on it, they'll be able to go watch it. Uh, but it's not going to be like a super crazy long stream. Because I got a lot of things that I need to do that are important and relevant <laughs> to what we'll be discussing. Um, there's a lot going on um, in the background right now. Uh, shit's, shit's busy. So, uh, Dr. Bloody, thank you so much for the five subs. So, uh, without too much further ado, um, uh, I hope you all have been having a really good week. I hope you're all really excited for the update for Shadows of Change. Uh, I am really hoping that it's going to be something special and that it's going to really start uh, the what will hopefully be a very strong year for Total War Warhammer 3 and take us into the future. So we've got quite a bit of story to get through. I'm not going to waste too much time. And uh, if you have questions... Feel free to kind of be posting them in the chat. Um, just note, I'm going to try and get us through the entire story real quick. Like, I'm just going to read through the whole story. And then we're going to kind of go back and hit points um, throughout the story. Um, and I do want to remind everyone that um, just some quick housekeeping things. Tomorrow, so not today, but tomorrow at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time is the um the first episode of the new who would win series with me and andy law um it's gonna be uh featured on my channel um though you know we'll alternate and do other things um but uh it should be a lot of fun we're gonna be doing malekith versus setra i'm gonna be basically the hype guy for setra and andy's gonna be taking up malekith's corner and we're gonna have a big raging nerd debate about who would win in a fight um, but there's going to be some pretty cool audience participation things, and we hope that you're going to enjoy it a lot. Um, you can find it uh, like the notify. Or it's already got like a thing up over on YouTube that you can go 
make sure you're notified for when it goes live. Um, it should be a very good time. We hope that a lot of people are going to show up for that. But um, the other thing is that this upcoming Sunday on Andy's channel, so the Lawhammer channel, um, we're going to be doing a Lorebeards episode on uh, basically Shadows of Change. So we're going to be talking about all of the new stuff that's been added to the game and how it affects the lore because there are some pretty dramatic uh, changes. Um, but it's also going to be talking about kind of Shadows of Change as a whole. Um, not just the updates. So that should be a pretty fun stream. There's going to be a whole lot of stuff about, um, you know, Cathay, Kislev, and Zinch. So hopefully you'll all have a lot of fun with it. And uh, like I said, there's going to be um, lots of stuff going on this week. So hopefully you're all very excited. And without further ado, let's go ahead and just do a brief read through of the story. And then we will start you know, following our way up from there. So funny enough, it's interesting that this is actually our second short story for Shadows of Change because the first short story actually came out with the original DLC, which featured Yuan Bo, also written by David Geimer. Um, and this, of course, is now a follow-up story, which is Things in the Wood, also by David Geimer. Uh, I will note just to kind of set some expectations before we go into the story that it's i think it's good to kind of look at this as like a black library type story which means that everything we're going to be reading in here is relatively canon um but some of it is going to conflict with what is like the hard canon which is going to be like old world lore um for instance is there are several mistakes in the or errors i guess would be the better way to put it in the original yuan Bo story um, there were like three or four things in that story that are actually not canonically accurate. So I suspect that will probably also happen with this story as well. So just keep that in mind as we're kind of going into the discussion here. But anyway, uh, without further ado, and Biofoot, thank you much, very much for 400 bits. First rule of who would win in the middle of the battle, the fishmen rise from the waves and attack both sides. No, 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 <laughs> no, no, we gotta, we gotta keep, uh, fishmen third parties out. Otherwise... Uh, otherwise no one will ever win. So let's get into it. Page one for things in the wood. I do like the cover art. It's pretty, um, mother Ostenkia looks the way they drew her face in this is kind of interesting. Um, she does like, she looks a little less old, but also a little less human, but mother Ostenkia is one of those characters where I think if you are really going to do like a very accurate portrayal of what she would probably look like um without having to worry about like the constraints of a video game and really like trying to follow a close storytelling thing she would probably be horrific to look at um like she would probably be so much nastier looking than this uh, but anyway let's jump into the story so like i said we're just gonna do a full read through and then we will come back and work our way back through it so we're not we're gonna try not to stop in our first read through so let's see what we got here Three grim-faced men glanced up from their fire. They were shabbily dressed horse nomads. Long leather tunics with fur sleeves and collars, strung with warding herbs and tokens. Baggy trousers, rawhide belts. Cone-shaped bash bashlik with woolly flaps obscuring their faces. Two of the three wore uh, short... Uh, oh, man. Slazbla. And uh, I'm going to say now, I apologize for all the pronunciations. Light cavalry blades with a single curved edge and a plain S-shaped hilt. The third sat with a large birdish, uh, birdish, birdish axe across his lap, running a whetstone around the curve of the blade. Three unstrung bow staves stood against three nearby trees. The fire had been prepared using pine cones, twigs, and bricks of dried animal dung. Its smoke was almost a fourth man around the fire, brisk and pungent, uh, thinking itself unnoticed amongst the bowing snow-coated spruces and pines. The three, or four, looked taken aback by Radig Brigny's sudden pine-thrashed appearance at the edge of their clearing. The axemen glanced at Radig's pony before shrugging and looking away. Blessings of Dawes, stranger, and Dawes is misspelled. <laughs> so, error one. <laughs> Lowering his whetstone, Axe offered up a wooden bowl piled with moist strips of venison carved from the small buck roasting over the fire on a spit. 
Radig felt his mouth fill with saliva and his empty stomach churn. How long had it been since he'd last eaten? Days, was it? It felt like weeks. His mad flight through the woods was a blur now. Overcome by the scent of venison, he urged his mount out from the trees and into the clearing, but she refused. Kazia was a shaggy oblast pony of some 13 hands, with a low barrel, with low barrel, stocky legs, and a large restless head. Her black mane had been plated and woven with yellow string. Her hooves were untrimmed and unshod, almost like claws. She ground the cold bit between her teeth and snorted, her breath clotting in the cold night air. Like all the best horses, Kazia was more than half wild, left to roam the seas, sea of grass east of Konochev, buttering for forage in the snow, shivering through the dark winter months, called back and pampered only when the Druzina had need of horses. Although small compared to the gigantic war horses favored in the southern realms, she would run for days without complaint, covering more ground and faster than any horse of the empire. She was crafty and stubborn, and knew her mind better than any man who might ride her. She knew when something felt right and when it felt wrong. I will say, I do like that description a lot. I, I wish we, I wish Total War was able to show more differences between the steeds of the various nations. Um, like comparing, uh, like Empire steeds versus Bretonian steeds versus Kislevite steeds. You know, right now we have Norskin and the Chaos Warrior steeds are different. You know, they're much larger and they're like really big and nasty. Um, it'd be nice if there was a little more separation between the other nations horses as well. And of course, versus like elven steeds as well, because there would actually be some really sizable differences. But uh, anyway, let's keep going. She blew restlessly. Her sides were lathered with sweat and melted snow. She had been galloping hard. Radig could feel her heart pounding against his knees where they sat against her ribs. His own cheek stung where a branch had clawed him. Something had been chasing them through the woods, but in his panic, he must have failed to see it because he could not remember what it had been or why it had been pursuing him. He shook his head to clear it of the confusion. Who are you? Radig asked the three men. He was not minded to trust three strangers in the wood, however. Oh, however fine their supper smelled. For all he knew, they were woodland fae, and he was to be next on their spit. What are you doing in the woods? Act shrugged. We live in these woods. Interesting, Woodland Fae. So that kind of implies that there might be Wood Elves living up. So, or there might be Wood Elves that the Kislevites are familiar with. Which is actually really interesting. Alright. Have done since we were children, said the second man, the smallest of the three. His voice barely more than a whisper. What are you doing here? I... Radig hesitated. A memory assailed him. Teeth and claws... Screaming faces, red droplets sprayed across the scaly white bark of a spruce. Kazia whinnying as the trees around them opened red slit eyes and sprouted horns. He shuddered and the memory passed. I'm looking for the way out of the forest, to Kurichiv. Yes, that was it. He had been trying to find his way home. He had entered the wood and lost his way and the same memory threatened to resurface. He stared into the stranger's fire until it retreated. The stream, yes... Yes, I... He trailed off. Axe gave him an encouraging grin, again pro-offering the bowl of venison. Kazia pawed the ground and gave a warning snort, but this time it was Radig's turn to refuse her. He was exhausted, starving, soaked through and shivering. The smell of roasting deer was just too appetizing to resist any longer. I have nothing to give in return, he said. I shot a rabbit and gathered a bushel of sticks for firewood, but I... Another memory threatened to show itself, but this one only teased, whiskering past the ankle of his consciousness before scurrying off into his mind's shadows. But I left them, for Mother Ostankia. The three men signed themselves to ward off the evil eye. The fire guttered, pulled at by a breeze that Radig, in spite of his sudden clothes, did not feel. It is a good man who remembers the mother, said Whisper. A wise one who shows it, said Axe. The third man, as hairy and sullen as a drowsing bear under his mound of wool, felt and fur, stared into the fire and did not speak. It is of no matter, Axe suddenly declared, declared suddenly, shaking off the disquiet. No Kislevite should turn a horse archer from his camp. Whisper merely grunted. Kazia wickered and again tried to pull away. Crunching the snow packed into the frozen creases of his coat, Radig dismounted. He was obviously warier than he had realized, because the drop to the ground was longer than he had expected. 
Stumbling like a man who had just fallen out of bed, Radig tossed the pony's reins over a branch, then walked to the fire in the middle of the little clearing. Sleet mizzled through the gaps between the trees. The twin moons fumed down on them all, the wind tearing at their silver halos. The men did not seem troubled by the rain. Radig sat down between Axe and Whisper and took the offered bowl, stuffing a fistful of venison into his mouth and swallowing without chewing. Still gagging on it, tears in his eyes, he scooped out the remaining contents of the bowl and forced it into his mouth. He closed his eyes in bliss. The meat was every bit as delicious as it smelled. Right then, Radig could not have cared who these men were or what they were doing in these woods. He would have betrayed his Druzina and given them his horse if they had asked for it. A new friend at our campfire calls for a song, I think, said Axe. Or a story, said Whisper. Yes, a story for your meal, stranger. He lifted a pot of kvass that had been warming over the fire and poured a stiff measure into a misshapen wooden cup. Radig offered the cup and gulped it, took the offered cup and gulped it down. He coughed as the fiery spirit chased the meat down his throat. What would you like to hear? A story we have not heard before, Axe smiled, his teeth appearing yellow and crooked in the firelight, and offered to top up Radig's bowl. Radig accepted the freshly carved meat gladly. Tell us a story of Mother Ostankia, said Whisper. Yes, said Axe, and slapped a brawny palm against his thigh. A tale of the Witch of Kislev. Dark knights should have dark tales for their companions. The silent man, as appeared to be his custom, said nothing. Very well, said Radig relaxing back onto the neatly folded horse blanket looking into the fire. I know a story of the hag mother, and, and it is all the more horrifying for being true. And then, of course, we have this beautiful piece of artwork uh, that actually shows up when you win a Mother Ostenka campaign. This is one of her, this is one of the pieces of art that shows up, which is fucking amazing. Um, but, uh, uh, Excellent. Uh, Jake Chrissy, I think you were the 20 months, by the way. Nurgle supremacy. <laughs> Nurgle supremacy. He's like, I don't care what we're talking about. <laughs> Where, where's Papa Nurgle? Um, all right. So let's continue on. And thank you for the kind of words in chat. I see those. All right. I was told this tale by an old Kassar from Zidrina, uh, a Stanitza far to the east where the great Dukils, uh, yeah, Dukils, Dukils, Dukiles. Let's go with Duke Isles. Forest folds before the world's edge mountains. I have never been there, nor he to Korochev. For all that the same river that gallops past my village as a stallion begins its life as a stumbling foal in Zidrina. We were in Volksgrad to face the Kyazak, the Northmen raids that came through the high pass that year with the spring floods. Kyazak. Hmm. Uh, yep, yep. Chaos comes down when spring melts through winter. That is very accurate. His name was Yuli. You, Yuli. Let's go with Yuli. His name was Yuli. He had a long coat of silver mail, an axe with golden lettering that he claimed to have been written by dwarfs, and a white cloak that had once belonged to a king amongst bears, or so I believed. I wonder sometimes what became of him after we rode from Volksgrad, for I never saw him again. But he is surely dead now. He was white-haired even then, hard as a piece of wood, and with three lifetimes of stories. I had not known until then that the Hag Mother is revered beyond the woods of Korochev, and not only in forests, but in wetlands and mountains and rivers and on the open steppe. The stories change from place to place. In Korochev, she lives in a hut woven from witchwood and blackthorn. A man can find it, we are told, by following the foul scent of the smoke rising from her chimney. For it never stands in the same place twice. In Chernozatra, yep, Chernozatra, beyond the high pass, she lives on the underside of a black lily pad that appears on the Zabadrelka River only when the chaos moon is full. Should the black lily pass Chernozatra west to east, then the Stanitsa can sleep soundly. But should it pass east to west against the river's normal flow, then the Charnozavstra Polk had best steal itself for doom rides south from the chaos waste. At such times, the Ottoman makes sacrifices to the river, in the hopes of flattering the Hag Mother into lending Charnozavstra her magic and her armies. In Zivdovsk, she is known as the Black Witch of the Crags. Her house is carried in the claws of a frost worm that she bound to her service through her infamous trickery. 
and to whom once every 10 years she feeds the prettiest girl in Zdovsk. Wherever a man can sit upon his horse and see neither church spires nor city walls, that is the land of the Hag Mother, the Witch of Kislev, the power the motherland turns to when its need is great and all others fail. Anyway, Yulai claimed to have once belonged to the Polk of the renowned Golden Knight, not the champion living in the Bokar Palace now, of course, but the one who wore the golden armor before her. Yulai was an old man when I met him, and this was some time ago. They say that Nardeska Lesa was already a greater warrior than her father in his prime. I do not know if this is true, only that any knight entrusted by the Tsar or the Tsarina to be their sword must be great indeed. Yulai's service to the Golden Knight brought him to the Rupsals, a region of densely footed highlands in the Eastern Oblast and a small village called Strusiv. It was a 20 day ride through tangled woodland and over jagged hills to find the polk of the March Boyar in Volksgrad. Half that, perhaps, for a lone rider on a determined horse to make the nearest Danitza of note in Chagev, provided Ursin kept his claws sheathed in the valleys clear of snow. The Golden Knight arrived in Strusiv to much fanfare to deal with a Bray herd that had been raiding from the Rupsals. The Hetman wished to flee, for villages like Strusiv are not built to be defended. They are quick to burn and quick to rebuild. The villagers could live in the wind for a season or two and let Tsar Winter deal with the Dark Ones, but the Golden Knight forbade him. I... Mm, okay, I really, really like that we're getting a lot of Golden Knight stuff in this as well. That's nice. All right. He vowed to hold Strusev, come what may, and to make the Beastmen suffer for their encroachment into the Blessed Motherland. And so the Polk fought. Each day at nightfall, the Bray Herd surged from the hills, men furred like dogs and with the heads of goats and rams, bearing primitive spears and with human skin stretched across their wooden shields, chariots drawn by foul horn-headed swine, minotaurs with the strength of a dozen men, twisted harpies from the high places, descending on the village in such screeching flocks they outnumbered all the arrows and thrusives twice over. They all met the Golden Knight's sword. And each day when the sun rose, it was over fields littered with the Dark One's misshapen corpses. But each battle became harder than the last. Their strength dwindled, even as that of the Dark One seemed to swell. The Golden Knight sought to inspire the defenders of Strusev with his own example, but even his own Kossars began to doubt they could prevail. Many fled. Yule confessed that he would have been one of them had his Rotomaster not anticipated his intention and confiscated his horse. On the eve of what was to be the final battle, the Golden Knight gave a thundering speech, reminding them of the tenacity and courage they had already shown, and promising all who stood by him that Kislev would come if they only held their faith. It was a good speech, but few were heartened by it. They were resigned to death and meant to face it with Kislevite disdain. But that night, against all expectation, Kislev did come. Not from the south, where the Golden Knight had commanded his Polk to look for it, but from the north, from the same wild hills that harbored their foes. The wind turned bitter, then died away altogether. A fog rose to fill that stillness. The long valley, crammed with brain gores working themselves up for their next assault, became an eerie lake, cracked horns and rusted spear tips bobbing over the gray mist like dead leaves. The defenders of Strusiv fell silent. Even hardened warriors like Yule felt their blood running cold. The laughter of crows descended on the village. A handful at first, then hundreds, then thousands. The sky turning black with them, scuffling like Empire soldiers for the last seats at a cox... Mm, a coxmaz. Men and women looked on in horror. Over a matter of mi as over a matter of minutes, every roof, fence, and wagon in Strusa became crowded by an army of ragged birds, all of them speaking at once. The, ways, the way that birds sometimes will when they know something that earthbound creatures like us do not. There was not a man in Strusev who doubted they had come to watch a slaughter. And that was when Ostenkia came. Hmm. She stood alone on the far hillside, so old and ugly that not even the beast dared approach her. Hunchback, wrinkled like a poisonous nut. Small tusks like those of a pig protruded from her lower lip. Tatty, homespun clothes draped her crooked shoulders. She carried a staff stung with charms and topped with animal skulls. A crown of filthy antlers sat atop her head, like a wart on an old woman's lip. 
In her other hand, she held a wooden ladle. With it, she stirred an iron cauldron, bringing forth more of the same fog that had already filled the entire valley in a, and a tattered witching light. Run, naughty children, and hide from your mother. She cackled over her cauldron. Her lisping voice rang from the hills in both Gospodarin and the dark tongue of the beasts. It'd actually be beast tongue. So that Yulai never knew for uh, never knew for certain which of them she condemned. She's boiling up vengeance that's hotter than coal and sending her spirits to tear out your soul. Lovely, she rhymes. <laughs> The light from the cauldron guttered and dimmed. The fog thickened, obscuring all but the tallest of the beastmen's battle standards. It rolled up on the valley all the way towards Thrusev, and the defenders cried out as they fell back from it, much to the mirth of the watching crows. A spear's throw from the village boundary, it halted and recoiled, like a flooded river hitting a stone wall. Muffled cries like the bleeding of lost sheep reached the men where they reformed their lines inside the village. Things moved within the fog. Dark, terrible things. The sort of things that, I am told, could almost make a man feel pity for the Dark Ones. The Golden Knight, more afraid of that mist than he had ever been of the Beastmen, plunged his sword into the hard ground and prayed. To Ursin, the Father Bear, for protection. To Tyr, for victory. To Daz, for the sunrise. When at last the Sun God granted that plea, the fog withdrew from the battlefield to leave no evidence that a battle had ever been fought. Not a single body was left behind, be that of be it of man or a beast, and the terrible fate that awaited them in Mother Ostenkia's cauldron was something Yule would not dare dwell on. The hag, too, vanished with the dawn. Only a single crow remained, stubbornly perched on the crossbar of the Golden Knight's banner and refusing to let go of it, however roughly it was shaken. Run, naughty children, the bannerman would swear he heard it say. But when there was no one but him... But no one but him to hear it. The Golden Knight broke up his polk and left Thrusiv soon after. The Rodas went their own way, to their own homes, while he and his retinue galloped to the Boker Palace to declare their victory. But those who had been there, men like Yuli, know that the real victory was Ostankia's. Yeah, tears should be tore. Um, so... It's random. Daz is spelled correctly this time, though, so... Okay, so that's really, really interesting. Uh, I like the way that the Golden Knight is utilized. Um, I like that here we see that the Golden Knight is clearly, while he... Granted, this is the knight before the current one, so this is Narieska Lesa's father, Mr. Lesa. For some reason, we have no idea what his first name is. Um, I guess nobody could be bothered to give him one, because uh, every time I've seen him referred to, he's only called the Golden Knight. Uh, or uh, Narieska's Lesa's father. So presumably his last name is Lesa, uh, but we have no idea what his first name is. Um, but it's interesting that he clearly seems to have a substantial amount of religious strength to him. Like he almost comes off not just as a representative of the Tsar and Tsarina, but he also... Uh, very strongly represents the great orthodoxy like he represents the pantheon um or at least he is kind of functioning almost like a patriarch in a sense so i am excited to see where that's gonna go all right let's carry on radig felt his eyelids droop he was unsure how long he had spent in the saddle before finding this place and between the hot food in his belly and the thick smoking fire against his body he was starting to feel warm he had pulled off his gloves, his sheepskin hat, and loosened the fastenings of his coat. His boots steamed by the fire. The occasional spat of drizzle wet the back of his head, but it was a pleasant feeling, soothing like the fingers of a parent through a drowsy child's hair. The three woodsmen had fallen silent while Radig told his story. Axe had taken up his axe and resumed his work with the whetstone. The rhythmic scrape of stone over iron murmured through the smoke, charming sp spruce and pine to deeper slumber. Do you call that horrifying? said Whisper after a time. He sounded offended. His wet skin glistening, glistened from beneath the flaps of his hat as he turned towards the Radig and caught the firelight. A few blonde wisps, like a boy's first beard, crisped the earthly smoke from the fire. The hag in your tail saved the entire village. Is that how you think of her? said Axe more mildly, still working his blade. A kindly spirit? 
a guardian of the wood? Kindly? No. But a guardian? Yes, I would say she is that. She is cruel, as a mother must be cruel. Because this is no world for softness. Children must be hard enough, inside and out, to endure a cold winter, and to hold a spear when the Kyazak come through the mountains. This is how she cares for the motherland. You don't believe me? Well, no matter. I have written all over Kislev. I have fought the Northmen, and heard my tale from the mouth of one who saw her magic turn to the defense of the land. Do you know another? The three men shared a look. I know another, said Whisper. All right, here we go. The story I know is similar. There was indeed a battle fought at Thrusev, and the Golden Knight was there, though only by chance, stopping in the Ropsels to eat the villagers' borscht and drink their vodka on his way south from some other campaign. It was a skirmish, nothing more. The North fights a hundred battles, just like it every summer, and Thrusev would have gone unremembered had Tsar Boris's Golden Knight not been there. Put it down to an old Kossar's exaggerations. Your friend spoke briefly of the village Hetman. He did not even mention his name, which would grieve him if he were alive. It was Miesk's... Miesko. Oh my gosh. Miesko. Druzina Miesko of Strusiv. And he is central to this tale. Your friend... Uh, let's see. Miesko had three boys. Grigor, Evegni, and Radimir. And it was for them that Miesko had counseled retreat. Not out of fear for their safety, you understand. The boys needed toughening up. And in Miesko's opinion, a season in the wind would accomplish that nicely. None doubted they would be great warriors one day, but this battle had come too soon. The Druzina raged at having his counsel ignored by some southern champion, but in private he relished the prospect of meeting certain doom alongside the legendary Golden Knight. For all his faults as a father and as a man, Miesko was Kislevite. As it was, Miesko's sons lived, though many sons and daughters of Strusev did not. Pyres were lit for them and many libati uh, libations poured. Sacrifices were made to Daz and his fl that his flames might carry their spirits to the great blue steppe to ride forever past the horizon. Out of respect for their mourning, the Golden Knight and his Rota consented to remain, but within the week they were gone. Back to the Bokar Palace, back to civilization. Your friend Yulai was right about one thing. This is Ostenkia's land. And some weeks later, the Hag Mother returned to Strusiv. You may read it as Miesko. Thank you. That is much easier to say. <laughs> she appeared as you described her. An old woman, shuffling into the village square with the age of, aid of a stick. Her back almost bent, bent almost to the ground under the weight of the wicked pannier on her back. The basket was filled with oddments from the valleys and grisly trophies picked from the battlefield. Polished stones, bits of stick, pretty feathers, horned skulls boiled in water, the stump of a cloven-hooved leg, a spear sticking out blade up, the ordinary jostling with the macabre. Her tattered rags reeked of stewed nettles and stale cabbage. The skulls on the top of her staff rattled with her step, as though the gods were rolling dice sealing the fates of men. As appalling as the hag must have looked to your Kassar friend, imagine the horror of finding her uninvited on your doorstep. Mother Ostenka wrapped the butt of her stick on Miesko's store. Door. Blech. Come out, come out, she said aloud. You come when mother calls. Now Miesko was a prideful man, as we know. He did not want to look as though he was afraid to face an old woman. But nor would he have his villagers think of him as the sort of man who came when his babushka called. He appeared at the balcony above her with an arrow knocked to his bow and demanded to know the witch's business. Mmm, that is already not a great way to start this exchange, my dude. <laughs> that is, that is, uh, that is not good. Ostenkia gave the Druzina an ugly smile. A life given for a life spared, she said. I spared 500 in savings through Siv from the Beastmen but asked for only three in return. Your sons, send them out, and you need never again see me. What do you want with my sons? The old witch laughed, as one might over a fool's grave. All say they will be great warriors one day, and mother knows best how to care for her children. Miesko, of course, refused. He ordered his men to seize the unarmed hag, 
but the Khazars feared Mother Ostankia more than their Druzina's tempter. Cursing their cowardice, Miesko loosed his arrow. It struck straight through Ostankia's heart. The villagers gasped in horror, but the old woman merely looked at the shaft quivering in her breast and cackled. It is said that Ostankia is not a creature of flesh and blood, but shaped by the old spirits from mud and grass and the ground up bones of dark things to be their queen, the true queen of Kislev. Others may say different, but I tell you it is true, and all who saw her that day believed it. Dismissing the Druzina, she turned then to the gaping villagers. They fell to their knees and wept for mother's mercy. I'll have what's mine from Miesco, or I'll have what's mine from you, she told them. Deliver me, my children, and be spared your master's doom. With that, she folded her arms about herself and exploded into a flock of crowing black birds. The Druzina called for archers to shoot the cursed birds down, but none dared move. Ostenkia left Strusev in peace for a second time. None doubted she would be back. I am really digging this story so far. The fact that she could get shot through the heart at point blank range is just like, all right, <laughs> like gave you your chance, son. The next day, the baker's daughter went missing while collecting berries in the forest. She was a sweet girl and well liked. The villagers greed, but none suspected this was Ostenkia's curse at work. The forest was dangerous and she should not have been there alone. Winter is long and come spring, the wolves often need needed to be reminded to fear human iron. No, often need to be reminded to fear human iron, yeah. Really, the fault was with the parents. But then it was the tavern keeper's son sent to the storeroom for a wheel of cheese never to return. As the days went by, Thrusev's children vanished one by one. Desperate parents took to hiding them in attics and cellars, standing watch at all hours, but always, come morning, one more from amongst the village, village's dwindling population of children would be gone, stolen away from behind locked doors like mist with the sunrise. The villagers appealed to their wise woman to avert the curse. In some places, they call these women hags or witches, but for all their herb lore and medicine, they have no real magic. There was only one hag in the woods, and her name is Ostenkia. When the woman's charms and potions failed, the village, the villages lynched her from a tree and burned her. <laughs> no family was spared Ostenkia's curse, except, it seemed, that of Druzina Miesko. Remembering Ostenkia's promise that whoever brought her children would be spared her curse, the villagers who had, so, who had fought so stoically against the Brayherds now turned on each other. Had the Golden Knight stayed one month longer, he would have been appalled at what he saw. He might even have wondered if the beasts had not been the victors after all, if the victory Ostenkia had given him was not an illusion of the notoriously tricksome hag. The, Dr the Druzina's Ibza, uh, Izba was a stout half-timbered dwelling of three stories, the bottom floor all in stone. Miesko and the few Kossars still loyal to him held out for days, fighting like rats to hold their own villagers at bay, until Miesko's own maid cracked his skull open with an axe and tipped his body off the balcony. The villagers cheered as they hacked their former lord to pieces and set fire to his izba. The boys were dragged out into the snow, barefoot and puffy-eyed from crying. Grigor, the eldest, fought until his knuckles were raw and he was so exhausted that he could no longer walk and had to be carried the rest of the way into the hills. Evegni and Radomir went quietly. They were too young to understand what was happening, only that the immense, oftentimes frightening, force of nature they called father was now dead. The villagers blindfolded them so they could not find their way back, then led them as deep into the wooded hills of the Ropsals as the villagers dared to go. There, calling out to Mother Ostenkia that they had done as she asked of them, they cut the children loose and fled to the smoking ruins of Strusev. And Ostenkia was true to her word, after a fashion. No more children were taken from Strusev, though neither were any ever returned. And the following year, when Norskia from the west ventured into what had been Brayherd territory, they found a village that had almost conquered itself. After the battle to depose Miesko, the villagers no longer had the resources to rebuild the walls they had destroyed, or to bring in the meager harvest they had sown. 
The marauders burned it to the ground in a single night of savagery and mounted the villagers' severed heads on spikes. It is said that Ostenkia saw all from her house on the hill and was pleased. The most important lessons are often the hardest to learn. Ooh. <laughs> oh my <laughs> okay uh i'm digging i i am really 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 enjoying how this story is really digging in on the horror of that mother ostenka ultimately is like she's not a good guy um like she is a force that debatably is as evil as chaos is without being chaos um Though obviously Miesco should not have, you know, he should not have fucked around with that. But let's see what the, I'm, I'm, it looks like there's probably one or two more stories. Let's see what we've got next. Raydig fidgeted as a softly spoken woodsman finished his tale. He wanted to dismiss the lump in his stomach as his just dessert for eating and drinking too greedily, but it was not that. His hands itched and his innards squirmed as though he had forgotten something profoundly important. But the unconscious part of him, the flesh and the bone remembered and now sought by its own means to remind him. This talk of lost children brought a fuzzy but deeply unpleasant sensation. It conjured an image of a small, dark-haired child running through tall grass, flapping her arms to frighten away birds from the recently sown fields. A girl who liked the color yellow and had woven it into the mane and tail of her father's horse so she could be with him when he rode. He saw himself in that image then, a rough man, a callous man, a weathered man kneeling before the simple shrine above his hearth and begging Dawes for a boy. Hmm, if, if he was begging at the hearth, he would probably be begging Soliak, not Dawes, but okay. A strong, healthy boy who could inherit Raidig's sword and ride in the rota when he was gone. He saw a dark-haired woman with exhaustion in her eyes. Her swollen belly showed through the homespun woolen smock she wore as she raised a limp hand in farewell. And in the memory, he waved back, pretending it saddened him even in half as much as it saddened her, clicking his tongue and shouting, Yah! as he wheeled away and galloped after his rota. He pressed his hand flat to his chest, but the ache was too deep for him to find. The memory shrank. By all the gods, how did I get here? What did I do? I think you scared him, said Axe, a smile creeping in his voice. He continued to work his blade with uh, with the whetstone. It was surely as sharp now as it would ever be, but he still worked at it over and over and over. I think you are right, said Whisper. What what happened to the three boys, said Raydig, unable to shake the suspicion that he already knew. The three pairs of eyes so similar to one another, as green as the forest was dark, glittered around their campfire and the other children who disappeared into the Rupsals. Axe shrugged. Some say they serve the Witch of Kislev still. That they and others like them fight alongside the spirits of the wild when she rouses the motherland to war. Or maybe it is just a story, said Whisper. Is it? Raydig said. Axe gave another shrug, another deeply buried smile pushing its way up through the heavy flaps of his bashlik, like a mole clearing away soil. I do not believe there is such evil in my land. Raydig shook his head head as though that alone would be enough to keep such a belief from perching itself there. The Tsarina would not allow it. Whisper visibly sneered at that, but Raydig went on. No, I won't believe it. He took a grip on his knees as though meaning to unfold his legs and get up, to jump onto Kazia's back and find his own way out of this cursed wood. But some fear he could not yet name held him in place. The skin on the back of his neck crawled, but he did not even dare to turn around and look back at where Kazia stood watching him. Here, with the three woodsmen in their fire, he was safe. Out there. I knew a man at Strusev, he reminded them, his voice almost as low as whispers. Can any of you say the same? Can you? The three men looked amused by the question. How could you have? Raydig shouted at them. Because when fear ignores all of a man's arrows, anger is always the last one in his quiver. That's a dope line. That's a dope line. You would have been little more than children. Okay, so obviously these are the three boys that were given to Ostankia. Would you rather hear a story from closer to home? Raydig turned suddenly as though struck to the third man, the silent man. He smiled at Raydig, but there was no goodwill in his dark green eyes. But steel yourself, friend, for this one took place in this very wood. Hey, Peanut Monster, thanks so much for the super chat. Appreciate that. 
All right, here we go. The Rosino Witek was a pious man. He commissioned the building of a stone church, larger than even that in Bolgasgrad, and sponsored many priests to preach in his village. The Bearer of Staslav, they called him, and not only for his huge stature and grisly temper when woken before noon. <laughs> yeah, I feel that. He ate meat and fish at least once a week as the strictures command, but never both on the same day. He bathed only out of doors. Oh, that's fine. So he's, a, he's an Ursonite. When rumors spread through the surrounding villages that a great black bear had moved uh, moved in the, uh, the Staslav forest, Witek took it as a sign of Urson's blessing. His priests demanded offerings of fish and berries to take deep into the woods, to the log cairn that stands as the bear father shrine in the Staslav, and for a time it appeared that Ursin truly had favored Witek. Pilgrims traveled from Bolskograd, from Erengrad and Prague, and even from the northern cities of the empire where Ursin is worshipped, to spread their gold ducats in Witek's church and see the famous bear. But never once did it show itself, nor claim the offerings left for it at Ursin's shrine. And it was not long before the bear of Staslav became a joke to describe anything that was not as advertised. If your new stirrup broke or your milk was sour, it was common, and guaranteed to find a sympathetic laugh, to blame it on the bear of Staslav. Stung by such mockery, Witek resolved to hunt the bear and kill it. No one would doubt his esteem with the father bear once it was stuffed and properly installed under the apse of his church, and then the pilgrims and their gold would soon return. Now, Urson allows such hunts so long as proper respect is given. Dogs must never be used, nor bows nor slings, though javelins are permitted. The bear must be slain in single combat and by hand, and prayers must be spoken afterwards. With a great entourage of priests and writers, marshaled by a hawkish patriarch of the orthodoxy named Zawishiza, Witek set off on his expedition into the woods. The hunt was to be led by a local man. Let's call him Kozel. He is the doomed hero of this tale, for while Witek was misguided and Zawisa blinded by zealotry, Kozel should have known better. He was a horse archer and had ridden from High Pass in the east to the Sea of Claws in the west in the service of his Druzina. He had fought goblins in the World's Edge Mountains and harried the Kiazak that raided from the north. Kozel knew his lands and its legends. He knew that the black bears of the Staslav, though descended from Ursin as all bears are, are marked by the Hag Mother. They are her servants and the guardians of, secret, of the secret trails. Oh, okay, I like this. So this kind of explains like the feral bears that you get in Ostenkia's army. And when Ostenkia leads the men of Kislev to war, it is the bears they ride. Ursin may allow for their killing, but the witch in the woods does not and the murmurings of priests have no sway over her. On the morning of the hunt's departure, she came to Kozel with a warning. His pregnant wife jerked in her sleep and sat suddenly upright. Her eyes snapped open, but she was not awake. Her eyes were the glossy whites of the hag, and when she smiled at him, she showed the dimples of tiny tusks inside her mouth. Come into the forest and Ostenkyo will get you, she said. Her voice was the rasp of wind through dried grass, and Kozel leapt out of bed and ran at once for Witek's Izba. In his terror, he ran headlong into Patriarch Zawishza and repeated for him the hag's warning. The Patriarch struck him a stinging blow across the jaw that put Kozel on his knees, warning the horse archer against repeating such heresies in the presence of the Druzina, lest Kozel's wife and daughter be the next offerings for the Bear of Staslav. So he left an offering of rabbit and brushwood in the hope this would appease the hag mother and led Witek's expedition as he had agreed. Okay, so I'm pretty sure that the main character of the story is Kozel. Um, he should have known better. Misfortune and woe followed the hunt thereafter. The weather turned against them. Rain made the going hard and miserable, as well as obscuring what spore the bear of Staslav might have left behind. Trees conspired to fall only across the hunter's favored trails, driving them inexorably into darker and more dangerous reaches of the wood. A hunter broke his neck when the howl of a wolf spooked his horse into throwing him. A priest, unable to see where he was going through the lashing rains, slipped over the edge of a ravine and fell to his death. Witek and Zawiza said prayers for them, but pressed on. The horses became difficult to manage, obliging the hunt to dismount and lead them, for they refused to bear their masters any further into folly. 
and the laughter of the hag rustled through every bush, whispered like a secret from tree to tree. At last, the eager Kozel finally struck upon a likely trail. Splayed footprints in the wet mud so broad they could not have they could only have belonged to the bear of Staslav. But, like all the pilgrims before him, Kozel would find no bear. A scream from the lead horse was the first warning of danger. The stallion kicked its hind legs at nothing, toppling sideways and losing its rider, but somehow did not fall. Horse and man hung in midair, wriggling helplessly in a glistening net of sticky silken webs. Oh no. <laughs> Two more riders walked into the same trap before they could stop themselves. Spiders the size of dogs swarmed down from the treetops to bind them in silk and ensure they never walked out again. Oh man, I mean those are basically, um, if you go back and watch my old uh, Monstrous Arcanum October Halloween series I did like two or three years ago now, um, these are basically how the silkens worked. It's just that in Total War, instead of using silkens, which would have required like entirely brand new models, they're just giant spiders. But this is literally what silkens do, um, except for it's like worse. Wittek drew his sword and spurred his horse to attack, for his faith was genuine, and Zawisa and his priests were not for show. Their battle prayer sent fire coursing through the hunter's swords and filled their hearts with bloodlust, even as the stench of burning spiders made their stomachs turn. The light of Dawes seared away the rain and the darkness, exposing the stealthily moving things that had been creeping through the woods in ambush. There was something of the wolf about them, something of the bear, something of old and wicked tree. Even revealed as they were, it was difficult for the hunters to distinguish them from the spruces and pines, for their skin was rough like tree bark and their mangy fur was tangled with clumps of moss and dead leaves. They were as huge as trolls, but disturbed not a single pine needle with their steps. Bale wolves, things in the wood. Something about them drove men mad. Some enchantment that had hardened warriors for getting their weapons or gawking in horror when good sense would have had them fleeing for their lives. When they struck, it was with a fury that no natural beast could equal. I am very, very glad the story talks about Beowulfs um, and is really like putting to rest the whole like obsession. Of everyone being like, ah, they're, they're, they're chaos monsters. Why are they in the Kislev roster? It's like things change. Shut up. <laughs> and that's also not how creatures work. We'll talk more about that at the end. Wittek bravely stood his ground and was the first to fall, torn to shreds by the Beowulf's monstrous claws. Urged on by the example of their priests, the huntsmen fought on with axe and bow, ripped apart one by one and devoured, or stung by spiderlings and dragged off into the trees. And what of Kozil, you wonder? What of our poor doomed hero? A Beowulf lunged across him to snatch up a chanting priest in its jaws. His pony reared in panic, but Kozo was a master horseman and a veteran of many battles. Controlling the animal with his knees, just barely holding on to his own wits in the face of such horror, he struck at the beast. His, uh, his Sazbla, I wish I could, Zazbla? Is it Sabla? Sabla? S Zabla? Uh, Sabla sounds reasonable. His sabla chopped into the monster's shoulder, but its hide was tougher than leather and the blow only angered the beast. His pony clattered back onto its front hooves, wrenching the sabla, uh, the sabla from his hands for it was embedded in the monster's back and would not come free. Swinging its jaws towards Kozel, the Beowulf bit the struggling priest in half. Drenched in gore and half mad with terror, the pony bucked, and with Kozel reaching for his sabla, threw her rider from the saddle. His forehead hit the monster's hard shoulder, shattering the thoughts that had been swirling around in there. But his hand was already outstretched and somehow found the protruding handle of his sword. He caught hold of it as the monster set off after his frightened pony and... His face hit the monster's hard shoulder, breaking the thoughts inside his head. Somehow his hand found the protruding handle of his sword, catching onto it as he fell. And... Oh, so it's like a loop. All right, time to find out what happens to shop. Okay, one person in chat says it's Sabla. Another person in chat says it's Shabla. Y'all come to a consensus. <laughs> All right, here we go. Here, This is the final portion. No! 
Radig pushed himself from the fire. He fell over in his panic, driving himself further on his back. He remembered it all now. The dying men, the screaming mutilated horses, the blood sprayed across the impassive trees as a mutated horror hoisted Witek's horse off the ground and wrenched the struggling creature in half the frantic chase through the woods. He sees now, Gregor. I think he does, Radimir. Okay, so these are the three sons. The three sons of Druzina Miesko smiled at him from behind their fire. Still on his back, Radig went for his sword. His, his hand closed over the emptiness beside his hip. The scabbard was empty. He remembered, striking the Sabla into the Beowulf's back, just as the Silent Man, or Grigor as Radig had knew him to be now knew him to be called, had described it. No, no, no. He shook his head firmly. This was a nightmare. A terrible, terrible nightmare. His sword was not in his scabbard because it was in his saddle holster with his bow. Yes, that was it. He scrambled over onto all fours, knocking over pots and bowls with his own drying boots, kicking dirt over the fire as his wool socks skidded on the mulchy ground. Half running and half crawling, he scrambled to where Kazia waited with her lead, or with her lead rein looped around a hanging pine branch. The pony's lips drew back, revealing large, sharp teeth. Radig's hand recoiled from her snarl. His heart lurched. It was not Kazia. The monster was three times as large as his pony, with a sloped back and all its mass loaded onto its muscular front limbs like a charging bear. Its head was brutally encased in bone, a pair of grubby white tusks the size of sword blades erupting from its lower jaw. A wintry mane of reddish-brown fur and rotting leaves ran down its neck. There was no saddle. No holster for sword or bow. What he had taken for melted snow and lather was, in fact, the sticky, wet blood of a butchered priest. The sword he had thought safely sheathed was sticking out of the monster's back. Harsh, inhuman laughter huffed through the brute's hard, bony nostrils. Its eyes were white and blind-seeming, but it saw him. He knew it felt it in the nodding of his bowels, heard it in the horror screaming up at him from deep, deep inside his mind. Radig dropped to his knees, all his limbs failing him at once. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Boys are always sorry, said, a, said the voice in the smoke, the fourth figure around the fire that Radig had so very nearly seen. Even then, he dared not look at her. When they are caught. Please... He thought of Sophia playing in the grass. Karth, um, Karthstrin? Karthstrin? Waving him farewell. A tear welled up in his eye. It was the first time he had wept since he was a boy, when his pony had broken a leg on the frozen river and his father had given him an axe and shown him what a man must do. He was Kislevite, and Kislevites, Kislevites did not weep. He blinked the tear away. You were warned against hunting bear in my wood, Ostenka hissed. Many times and in many ways were you warned. What are you going to do with me? Now, said Evegni right behind him now, Mother Ostenka is going to get you. His axe, as Raided Bregni had suspected, was very sharp. Whoo! Okay, so that, A, really good story. I enjoyed this a lot. I think it did a very, very good job of reinforcing a lot of kind of the older lore we have from like the um, Realms of the Ice Queen book uh, back during uh, second edition Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay where we get a lot of modern Kiss Live lore from. Jonathan Scott, nine minutes ago, super chat. Slanesh, search Mother Ostankia on roll 34. Please don't. <laughs> no. No, <laughs> don't. Um, Arian Aranthiel. Uh, so, Sotek, is Mother Ostankia now like the witches of Crookback Bog in The Witcher 3, at least based on this book of her? Also, thoughts on the book? Well, it's a short story, um, just to be very clear. Um, so, this lines up with a lot of the old lore we have when it comes to the hags, right? Especially if you go back and watch our lore, the lore beards episode I did with Andy on the, the hags of Kislev, where the thing about the hags is that you are dealing with a almost primordial force of nature, right? An ancient force 
that does not truly have... It does not have the human morality of good and evil. It is something far, far, far worse and more horrifying. Um, where you're dealing with a force that is so ancient that you can't apply human morality onto it. You as an individual do not matter to Mother Ostankia. What matters is essentially her laws that she is a strict mother, right? She enforces the rules and she tells you the rules. And throughout this story, we see in almost all of the stories, there are warnings, right? There are moments where either Mother Ostenkia herself, either directly or through like omens, gives warnings to people to follow the rules, follow the laws because you are on her turf. She allows you, she allows humanity to live in her woods, in her marshes, in her bogs. But should you, if you don't obey, you know, if you try to break the rules out of arrogance or pride or whatever it may be, you're, you're donezo, man. You're donezo. And that's actually what I really, really like about this character is that Ostankia is not a character that works along a morality of like what is good and what is evil. She works along a morality of there is a set of ancient, unspeakably ancient packs, um, bindings and laws that she works along and everyone is expected to follow them. Uh, everyone. There is no, there is no innocence, but at the same time, at the same time, what's actually really, really interesting in this story is that mother Ostankia is not overtly evil, right? All of the children that she takes from Thrusev, the village, she doesn't kill them. Like, it's not like, you know, if, if she was full on evil or she was like a chaos character, those children all would have been like sacrificed to the dark gods or they would have been fed to monsters or tortured or strung up somewhere in the forest as a warning, but she doesn't. She takes all of those children and she raises them um, because they have a purpose. You know, there is something they are meant to do. Now, this is essentially, uh, this is essentially kind of explaining the humans and Mother Ostankia's faction almost to a sense where like the humans that she has access to those very, very basic um, mortal units are essentially people and children that she has taken um, from the uh, she's taken from Kislev as part of that, that relationship because the whole thing that I really, really like about mother Ostankia is she doesn't do anything for free. And I don't think it's because she's cruel. I think it's because she's fair, but she's like, she's like the most dangerous kind of fair, right? Um, you know, like how, uh, for like a kind of a pop culture moment, you know how, when you're watching like the dark Knight, the, the, the second movie in the Batman trilogy, Nolan's Batman trilogy, when the Joker has his whole speech with, um, two face and he's like, it's, you know, the thing about the thing about like things that uh, like a cruel morality that a lot of people would see as uncaring and cruel is that it's fair, right? It's unbiased. It's, you know, it's the only way life is fair. And I think that's what they're kind of trying to portray with Mother Ostankia is that she's not evil. Um, she's fair. But the pro but the thing is, is that if you break the rules, the punishment is extreme and there is no true forgiveness. Like there is no forgiveness at all. Where like when Mother Ostankia came to the village of Strusev after the initial battle where she killed all the beastmen for them, you know, she comes to the village and she says, all right, I, I think she said what? I saved 500 lives and in exchange, I'm only going to ask for three. Now, granted, she knows 
that these three boys are kind of like destined to become great warriors. But she says that's a fair exchange and that's the price for survival is that you give me these three boys. And the second that that was refused and the people of Strusev did not immediately, did not immediately, um, like, kill the Druzina and take his kids to give them to her to fulfill the pact, that village was doomed. It was utterly doomed, right? Where that, at that moment, they, they, they were absolutely boned. Because even when they eventually finally killed the Druzina and they took his sons, they, it, it took too long. It took them weeks to do it. So when she finally stops taking their kids away, she also no longer protects them because they violated that pact. They, they broke the agreement. Um, which is really, really fun and fascinating. And I think makes for a really fun storyline of that. I, I like these kinds of characters, especially in the Warhammer world of that. She is completely intolerable of chaos and she would be even more intolerable of forces like the dark elves, right? Um, what I think would be really, really interesting is that, um, what I think would be really fascinating is that Mother Ostankia would have such a unique dynamic with like the Wood Elves, for instance, where like the Azre function by a very, very similar concept and system. Um, where the Forest of Athel Lauren has extremely strict rules about what you are and are not allowed to do. And if you violate those rules, the punishment is death and honestly worse than death. A lot of the time. Um, uh, but Mother Ostenka is almost an even more extreme version. Um, but th I, I think the really, really fun aspect about her, though, is that she's still a mother to Kislev. And the people of Kislev are her children. Like, they, they fall under being her children and are protected by her as long as they behave which is fascinating how similar is mother thank you to the three witches of crookback bog and the witcher three i don't think she i think there are similarities and that they use really horrific forms of magic um they're able to summon all sorts of nightmarish creatures they use really dark and um uh spooky bargains and that in order to earn their favor, you have to give something in return. But the thing, I think the big difference between them is that the witches of Crookback Bog are more power hungry and they're more evil. They're more sinister, right? Um, whereas Ostenka is not, she is very sinister, but she's not evil, right? Where, where the hags of Crookback Bog are going to murder and either devour or use children uh, to satisfy their own ambitions and goals, Mother Ostankia instead takes in the children and raises them as her own because there is a purpose to the motherland of Kislev that they must serve. And I think, I think that's the core difference, right? Is that the hags of Crookback Bog in The Witcher 3 are out for themselves and are really nasty, horrible creatures that only care about themselves and their own, like, objectives. Mother Ostenka cares about the land. She has, she kind of has a boss, if that makes sense, right? She has an entity above her that she serves, being, like, the ancient widow. And we know that Ostenka has a relationship with the Kislevite gods, um, such as, uh, Ursin, Soliak, you know, Torin does, um, granted, she seems to lean much heavier on like the Ursin and Soliak side of the relationship. Um, one of the things that's actually really interesting about this story that I find particularly curious is that Dawes is actually painted very heavily as an antagonist to Mother Ostankia. where like Dawes and Ostankia are on separate sides of the scale, which makes sense. Because Dawes is very heavily painted as this god of, you know, he's a sun god, um, 
but he's also a god that represents civilization, uh, wealth, um, a lot of what, like, southern Kislev, or essentially the Gospodars, value in life. Dawes almost comes off more as, like, a New Age god who is, like, the bright, shining future of civilization, whereas Mother Ostenka is the dark, horrible shadows of what we've come from and what the foundation of everything we're standing on is. Um, I actually really, really like that this story shows that Dawes and Ostenkia stand on very opposite sides of a spectrum. Whereas like Urson is more in the middle of that spectrum where like you could see that Urson is more forgiving and more acceptable of humanity um, where he allows humanity to hunt his bears. He allows humanity to like rise up further in his esteem uh, and to like prove themselves to him through their worship. Mother Ostenka has no tolerance for humanity interfering. They are allowed to live in her space so long as they follow the rules. But the second they fucking break those rules, it's game over. Whereas the other Kislevite gods would be uh, technically more forgiving. Um... Knight of Ren, thank you for the bits. I would consider her more of an anti-hero. Mother Ostenkia is one of those characters who her alignment is going to depend on what... It's going to depend on what direction you're looking at her from. If you are living in Kislev City, right? If you're in Kislev itself, and you have been very familiar with Tsarina Katerin and the way that she lives and rules, and then you have to go out and deal with Mother Ostenkia... Mother Ostenkia is going to come off as evil as fuck. Like, she's going to be a horrible, brutal, nasty, horrific monster who asks for way too much. And she is, like, you don't know the rules of the game, right? And it's going to be really fucking spooky and scary. Whereas, if you're dealing with chaos, right? You're dealing with the forces of chaos where you're dealing with demons that are hungering for your immortal soul. They're inflicting you with mutations. Um, they seek to quite literally destroy the world. There is no survival through chaos. Chaos ultimately leads to destruction. It leads to the end of all things. Um, you know, a final cataclysm of all cataclysms that's going to tear asunder reality itself then Mother Ostenkia is a guardian. She is a protector who has to be this ruthless. She has to be this dangerous and horrible because only through such strict and such an iron fist policy can she hold back the tides of chaos, um, which I find very, very interesting. How old is Mother Ostenkia? We have no idea. We, we don't, I, this short story doesn't seem to give any hints about how old she is. Um, like, she could be as old as the Cataclysm. She could be from a little bit before the Cataclysm. She could be from only when the Ungols arrived in the land of Kislev. You know, maybe when the Ungols originally came, she was once one of the, you know, the original Ungols, and she kind of pulled an Ariel and an Orion where she was like an old wise woman that was leading the Ungol people, and then she forged a pact with the ancient uh, ancient widow, and she became Mother Ostenkia. But, you know, this story kind of implies that Mother Ostenkia is not actually human. That's kind of one of the interesting things, right? Is that the story, the story talks about how Mother Ostenkia is not human. She looks human-ish, but she isn't. She's actually, like... A, she's more like a spirit given physical form that's made out of mud and reeds and you know all of the natural elements of the bogs and the fens and the deep forests and the the crags um and you know she gets shot in the heart and is like all right that's cute um which kind of seems to lean towards the idea that maybe she was never human uh, but you could also argue that she started off human from some horribly long ago time, but, uh, you know, as time passed, she became 
more and more and more just this thing. Um, where, like, Ostenkia is the land of Kislev itself embodied in an entity. Um, but she's, like, a very particular version of it. I think, I think if I had to guess, based on the, like, based on the various quotes that she says in Total War Warhammer, based on, like, some of, like, the little dialogue, or the little lore snippets you get on, like, her skill tree and about her items and all this stuff, um... I would probably guess that she's more like Orion and Ariel where she maybe was once human. And then she for like, she was the original hag, right? She was the first ever human that made contact with the ancient widow or the land of Kislev itself. And she was given this mantle and it's transformed her and she, but she's lived for so long that she is, you know, no longer anything close to being human. So you could kind of see her as like a a living incarnation of the ancient widow or of Kislev itself, which honestly would explain a lot of her bitterness um, and a lot of her uh, cruelty uh, if she kind of is the ancient widow. Um, but... Um, I, I like it a lot. Um, what do I think about her speaking dark tongue? Well, that, that makes a ton of sense. Because what is dark tongue, right? Um, dark tongue is the language of demons. Dark tongue is the language of spirits a lot of the time. Um, if you are talking to entities from the ether, entities from beyond, which is what spirits are, like the spirits of the land of Kislev itself, dark tongue is very, very likely a language that you're going to use. Um, granted, you could make the argument that Mother Ostenka was simply, she's so like kind of primordial and all reaching because the story mentions that as she's talking, people are hearing her voice in Gospodarian and Dark Tongue or ac more accurately Beast Tongue simultaneously. So it could be said that she's not actually speaking dark tongue. She is speaking true, like she is speaking a true language. She's speaking the actual language of the ether itself, which has a different name. Um, she is speaking the true tongue, the tongue of like the gods, where it doesn't matter what she, what actual words are coming out of her mouth, you will understand them no matter what. So, like, if she was speaking to a crowd where everybody understood different languages, everyone would understand what Mother Ostenkia was saying to them. Which is horrifying, because that would mean she is horrifically powerful and ancient. Because that is a language that virtually nobody speaks. Um, like, that is the language of demons, spirits and entities that are not of this world. Yeah. Um, but I like this story a lot. I think it does a really good job of setting up a lot of the adversarial relationship between like Mother Ostenkia and the, you know, Mother Ostenkia and the the Czars and the Tsarinas and Mother Ostenkia and the the uh, the Great Orthodoxy, um, which is a lot of fun. Um, do Onyx Chromans speak Dark Tongue? No, they speak. To my understanding, they speak Cathayan, but Chromen are also kind of like crazy. Uh, they actually might not speak Cathayan. They might have a unique tongue. Um, cause if I recall correctly, like they have a specific language they speak that, that they communicate with each other and only certain entities can understand them. Um, uh, but like most people can't even see them, uh, because they're, you know, they're literally elementals of yin magic, which the magic of yin is the magic of darkness, not like in an evil sense, but like in a true sense. So like most people can't even perceive Onyx Chromen. Um, that being said, though, like, I would love it if it turns out that Mother Ostenkia is quite literally just the Ancient Widow, or at least an embodiment, an incarnation of the Ancient Widow, because that would make her insanely old. That would make her so fucking old. 
Like she would be, she would either be as old as the Cataclysm or she would possibly even be pre-Cataclysm. Um, one of the things that me and Andy talked about that was actually really, really fun to speculate on was the idea of why is the Ancient Widow called the Ancient Widow, right? Because the Ancient Widow implies that you are talking about a god that was once married. You are talking about a god that used to have a husband or used to have some kind of partner that was destroyed or killed or died. And one of the things that would be really fucking cool and would actually do a really good job of tying a lot of really interesting lore beats together is if it turns out that there were multiple gods in Kislev, like a duo, and that in the age before chaos, where there was like a war, or like or right when chaos showed up, where you have this war of the gods, where if Cain, um, the bloody handed god who wields the Widowmaker, which is a god killing weapon, um, would be, it would be such a fucking awesome piece of lore to leave just a couple of crumbs to suggest that the Widowmaker is responsible for the ancient widow becoming a widow. Um, which would be fucking awesome. I would love that story beat. Um, Linda Broch, since this doesn't even mention the Dark Elves, do I think we'll get a new start with her, start for her with the Total War update next week? Oh, well, the, the Total War update's not next week. It's in two days. Um, and no, I'm, I am 100% sure Mother Ostankia is not getting a new start position. Um, the start pitch, the start position in Immortal Empires kind of already justifies itself where it basically says like the, the idea behind her Immortal Empire start position is basically that the Dark Elves have become such a grotesque threat to Kislev. They're attacking it on such a regular basis. The Black Arcs have been getting more aggressive. They're unleashing more dark sorcery and they've been doing all this stuff that they have essentially offended Mother Kislev, right? They have offended uh, Mother Ostankia and she has finally had enough. And she uses kind of, you know, the hidden paths through the, um, through the forest to go to the twisted, ancient, gnarled forest of Nagaroth itself to teach them some manners, essentially. Um, but, um, like, is it, like, a great justification? Eh, you know, it could use some more to it. Um, but I don't think that it'd be great for Kislev to start in... I do not... I would not want Mother Ostankia to start in Kislev. Um, I like that she starts somewhere exotic because it makes her campaign a far more unique. What I will say, what I will say, I do wish that Mother Ostankia would get a quest at some point between like level one and like maybe level 10 where she gets a, a she gets a quest where if you fulfill the requirements, you get the option to take control of what's that settlement? Is it Plesk? Um, the, the settlement where she has her unique building that kind of represents where the ancient widow is buried. Um, that way she could get like an easy foot in the door to having a settlement in the Kislevite area. That being said, like as someone that's played a fair share of Mother Ostankia campaigns, it's very, very easy. Um, it's very easy to go to Kislev if you want to with Mother Ostankia. Because all you got to do is unlock the teleport hex, which I think is the third hex that you get. Um, but if you unlock the teleport hex, you can literally just teleport yourself to Dreich's forest and then just go north and you're in Kislev. Um, and you can just like start taking over territory. Um, that being said, uh, I, I think, I do think that Mother Ostankia having like a little quest that gives her a foothold in Kislev, um, or, or maybe even doing like a dual start, something like that. Um, I, I think those would be nice. I, I think that would be a fine change because I think that would kind of settle um, a lot of the issues people have with her start position, um, you know, to make it more, that way you still feel like you're playing a, that way you still have the ability to go focus on a Kislevite campaign if you want to. Um, 
If she's that old, why is she so attached to Kislev instead of the great forests like wood elves or other ancient places? Dead air, that's a great question. So I, there's no actual answer for you, right? Like there's no written in text answer to give other than to say, we know two things, right? The first thing we know is that Mother Ostenka is bound to the motherland and the motherland is Kislev itself. And there is something very unique about Kislev where there is some kind of power or entity that is ingrained within the land itself that has made it where the land is vaguely sentient or, or extremely sentient and actively defends itself by luring people to it and basically forging deals with them in order to make them more powerful. It did it with the Ungols, where it lured the original Ungol people um, over the mountains uh, from the east to settle into what we now know as Kislev. And it did the same thing with the Gospodars, where it reached out to the Gospodars who lived way up on the eastern steppes and convinced them to make the journey down across, uh, basically following the Road of Skulls, down across Zornu School and uh, across the World's Edge Mountains into Kislev and basically gave them ice magic. Um, Athel Lauren is a different scenario in that we know what's going on with Athel Lauren, which is that Athel Lauren is quite literally a sentient magical forest. Um, granted, I'm not exactly sure where the lore is right now about how unique Athel Lauren is. Um, the lore has been pretty wibbly wobbly on it. Like in the eighth edition Warhammer Fantasy lore, the lore got retconned to say that Athel Lauren is the only true magical forest in the sense that it's the only force in the world that's sentient because the old ones literally planted it like the old ones the, the gods that created humanity the elves the dwarves all those guys one of their experiments along with elves and dwarves and all that was to create athel lauren where they created a forest of sentient um spirits and trees and all this stuff that was able to expand and grow and develop um, um, I don't know if the old world is going to keep that lore or if they're going to retcon it to say something else. Um, but it will be very, very interesting to see. I will say, um, so Ostenka could be old enough to have taught Marathi dark magic. I, I highly doubt that Ostenka and Marathi ever met, um, at least back in like ancient times. Because Ostenkia seems very specifically not bound, but only cares about the land of Kislev itself. And Marathi never went to the old world for like the longest fucking time. Marathi stayed in Ulthuan for a super fucking long time. She was not a world traveler um, for a lot of it. Um, like she stayed in the old world and most of her power came from making packs with demons and being really fucking clever about it. Wasn't it supposed to be Arianka that was in Kislev before she and the other gods got retconned? Uh, it, it depends on which version of the lore. Arianka is one of the, like, is one of the myths. It's one of the stories. Um, the, the lore they seem to be running with for the old world and for the Total War Warhammer version of Kislev seems to be the ancient widow storyline which the ancient widow is some kind of ancient deity that is um, kind of in an eternal slumber um, or like a death coma or whatever you want to call it, um, hiding away in the uh, the forested highlands of uh, like northeastern Kislev. But she seems to fucking hate chaos. What do I think? Uh, do I have anything more to speculate on the mention of the Woodland Fae? Yeah, that's actually a really interesting thing. So in the story, we do have mention of the Woodland Fae, which is a really interesting thing to bring up because it implies that the forests of Kislev have issues with Woodland Fae, which for those that don't know, Fae, in the Warhammer world, Woodland Fae the vast majority of the time is referring to wood elves, like the actual elves themselves. They are the fae of the forest. 
Um, so like the Bretonians often know the, they know the Azrai as the Fae. Um, that being said, in Kislev, um, it could be that that's what they're referring to, is that there are, there are Fae woodland, uh, woodland Fae that live in the forest of Kislev, which would mean that there are wood elves that have a presence in Kislev, which would make a lot of sense um would make uh that you know it wouldn't be that unusual for what else to show up in that part of the world because they're fighting against the forces of chaos or they're trying to deal with like certain kind of prophecies or certain kind of threats to ancient forests um what's interesting though um is that there it, it may not necessarily be wood elves though it could be something else um because fey to the Kislevites, it could have a different definition. It could just mean a spirit of the forest. Um, but to me, it really seems to come off as them talking about Azrai, which is quite fascinating. Uh, because according to most maps that we have, even for the old world, there have not been any Azrai anywhere near Kislev in like a really fucking long time. Um, unless something bizarre has been going on. Now it could be, it could be that the elves of Laralorn sometimes wander up to Kislev, but you know, who's to say it's hard. It's, it's, it's a fascinating thing to consider. Marksman and thrones of decay. Yay or nay. What would you define as a marksman? That's kind of a vague term. My theory is that the ancient widow is a reflection of Arianka that separated from her main body when she got locked away. Could be, could be, um, Arianka, but the copyright numbers fall, file off. Well, Arianka is introduced in the same book that the ancient widow is. They're they're considered like they're kind of considered different theories, so to speak, of like where uh where the magic of Kislev comes from. There are several like gods or entities that are kind of kicked around and suggested to be potential truths behind what is Kislev, what is the motherland with parts of the book saying, oh, it's this Arianka character who's like entombed beneath one of the cities. I think she's beneath Prague. Um, and there's another one that's like, no, no, no. It's actually the ancient widow who's way up in the northeastern uh, forest of Kislev. And then there's another one that's like, oh, no, no, no. It's actually that it's just the land itself is sentient and there's not actually like an entity behind it, but it's more of kind of like an Athalorian type situation. And then there's another one that's like, oh, no, 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 no. It's actually more that it's like the Ursin. Uh, it's like the actual like pantheon of gods that you're familiar with, but like through different guys. Um, so it like it purposefully gives you different answers to deliberately confuse you. Imperial marksman, Hawkland, uh, long rifles and or repeater, iron size ROR. Uh, I would say that I think it is extremely likely that Thrones of Decay is going to have a Hawkland long rifle generic unit. Yes. So either, and I, th with the, either the unit will just be the Nuln iron sides where the iron sides will become a generic unit like they did with Bugman's Rangers or it could be that there will be a generic unit of like Hawkland long rifle, you know, infantry and the Nuln Ironsides are the ROR version. It'll be one of those two. Um, but I, I feel pretty confident that'll happen. They could be all three with the main, the mother and the crone, which is common in Slavic myth. That's very, very true. Um, th yes, that is true. Where the main mother and the crone is a, is a very popular, uh, Slavic myth and definitely has its places within Kislevite lore. So that, that's true. They could all be, you know, it could be that all three are true. Um, but, you know, working kind of in a harmony sense. Though Mother Ostankia uh, is definitely leans more on the uh, crone side of the spectrum. And the Ancient Widow as well. I'm worried that Warhammer 3 is just going to be homogenized. Um, I wouldn't worry that much about that, to be honest. Um, like, overall, most of the faction's characters are in the faction's homelands. But every, you know, when they've got more than like, once the space is essentially filled, then it's like, all right, where, where else can we send this person to give like, you know, an interesting new experience and you throw them off somewhere else. So, in, you know, in the case of Ostankia, it's like, oh, let's put her over in Nagra. Same thing for Tarix, right? Um, like one of the big problems with Warhammer Fantasy Beastmen, which we talked about on the Malagor Lorebeards episode this past Sunday, which you should go watch if you haven't already. It was a great episode. Um, one of the things that we talk about is that one of the big weaknesses of the Beastman Army book that kind of really sucked 
was that the Beastman Army book only focuses on the Empire, right? It does not follow... It doesn't talk about any of the other Beastmen across all of the other, like, six or seven continents, which is really, really dumb. Um, it's a very Empire-focused perspective. So taking characters like Malagor and Tarux and taking them out of the Empire and throwing them somewhere else in the world... Great, cool, awesome. Because there are beastmen in other places of the world and they should be represented with playable factions. So you're having like a very interesting different experience. The idea of Mother Ostankia, you know, leaving Kislev through ancient forest paths and wandering into the the Deadwoods of Nagaroth, which very specifically the, the Dark Elves have mistreated. The Dark Elves do not care for the land of Nagaroth. They have not maintained that pact that relationship between them and the land between them and nature that they're supposed to so the idea that mother ostinkia would show up in nagaroth and use the very land itself against the dark elves because they've abused it and they have not properly cared for it um to me makes a lot of sense while also allowing her to punish an arrogant faction that has attacked kislev and deeply weakened kislev many many times um I don't think it's that much of a stretch at all. Who is the mother? If we go with the main mother in the crone, um, man, I'd have to actually crack open my realms of the ice queen book to look through it. But like the three kind of big ones that you'd probably be looking at as far as like your characters would probably be your ancient widow, um, Arianda and probably Mishka, which of course Mishka has had descendants. Plus, then we get the hag bowl, right? We get that we get the hag on hag action that everybody everybody uh <laughs> everybody hops online for. Lugan, Mother Stenka really feels weird being that far off from a lore perspective. Okay, okay. So here's the thing, right? From a lore perspective, you are correct. Having Mother Ostenka and Nagaroth is weird from a purely lore perspective, but the video game is not about the lore. Like, it uses the lore. Um, it uses the lore to strengthen itself and to make it more compelling and to make it more fun, but the game is not lore accurate. It's not lore accurate at all. It has never been lore accurate. Um, and saying, well, Mother Ostenka should be in Kislev because, or somewhere very, very close to Kislev, because it doesn't make sense for her to be somewhere else. It doesn't really matter. Um, what you're looking for is a very unique, fun, new start position that's very far away from the other characters. Because you don't want all of your Kislevite characters to start in the exact same place. Where no matter which Kislevite campaign you play, they're all the exact same. Where it's like, okay, Kostaltin is in Kislev. Katarin is in Kislev. And Boris Ursus is on the teeny tiny edge of the realm of chaos, or the chaos waste more accurately, right next to Kislev. If you put Mother Ostenka along the Skull Road, she would be very, very close to where Boris is. And that would basically mean that all four of your campaigns would be in the exact same place, which I just don't think is good game design. Like that's boring game design. Um, it's better for Mother Ostenka to be in Nagaroth. Uh, I realize it does not make a ton of sense, um, but they give a justification. It's not a very strong justification, but it is a justification. Uh, and it allows for her to have a very, very different play style where you're fighting elves. You know, you're fighting dark elves and tomb kings and lizard men and high elves instead of fighting warriors of chaos, Norska, chaos dwarves, Kislevites, vampire counts, right? It's just, it's just different. Um... And it's like, I feel like if you try and pull out the, oh, well, Mother Ostenka doesn't make sense in Nagaroth. Like, okay, if you're going to take that position, then you also, by that rule, need to be arguing that, okay, Grom has no business being in Bretonia. Tarix has no business being in Nagaroth. Um, uh, Rakarth has no business being in Lustria. Tic-Tac-Toe and Krokgar have no business being in the Southlands. Because, like, okay, none of these characters have ever been to these places. So, like, 
they shouldn't be allowed to be in these places. Like a lot of the characters would be forced to move and would all just be in the same goddamn place. Like all of the Lizardman characters should be in Lustria. All of the Dark Elf characters should be in Nagaroth with like the exception of Lokir Felhart. All of the High Elf characters should be in Ulthuan. Uh, like Emric has no business being in the Darklands. Kotep has no business being in uh, Nagaroth. Grombrindle has no business being in Nagaroth. Scarbrand has no business being in the South. Well, demons are kind of a little bit more of an eh. Uh, but like, you get what I'm saying, right? You get what I'm saying that I, I just don't think that arguing start positions for like, like, oh, this character really doesn't work here. Uh, like, man, that we lost that. That fight was shot dead in the water way back in Warhammer 1. It's just weird to me. She's the character they picked for that. It's just because she's the most recent. That That's literally the only justification. It's, it's not that, so it's not that they like looked at Mother Ostankia and went, oh, Mother Ostankia is the character that should be super far away. Um, what, you know, what it is, is that, okay, we have, get, we've had three Kislevite characters and they're in Kislev. So now we have a new one. Let's put her somewhere because everywhere else is just full. If Ostankia is full, this powerful, would she survive the end times? No. Because the end times is what it says on the label. The end times is is the end of all things. It is the apocalypse. She starts in Nagarum, but the first thing you want to do with her is teleport back home to Kislev. That's not how I play Ostankia. I really, really, really enjoy Ostankia campaigns. What I do, generally speaking, is I start a Mother Ostankia campaign, and I usually very quickly recruit either a second hag or uh, usually you get a free patriarch in like the first five-ish turns. Um, so I'll either take the free patriarch I get or a second hag mother, and I will send my hero into the ocean and tell them to sail all the way over to Kislev, um, which takes a little while, but not like, you know, it takes like maybe five to 10 turns um, and allow them, that allows me to establish a relationship with Kislev. And then I just start doing diplomacy stuff um, until I can confederate them, which usually doesn't take that long. Sigmar survived? No, he didn't. Sigmar died. L okay, listen, listen, listen. Okay. If you're asking me, could Mother Ostankia show up in Age of Sigmar? Yes, but that has nothing to do with how powerful you are. There are weak characters and powerful characters that show up in, uh, in, uh, Age of Sigmar. Um, how strong you are doesn't really have anything to do with it. Five to ten turns. I may have been underestimating. I don't know. I haven't, <laughs> I haven't done that particular thing in a while. <laughs> like, could, could Mother Ostake you show up in Age of Sigmar? Yes, absolutely. Hammond, thank you for the super chat. It's unrealistic. You don't know your lore. Shame. Yeah, it's true. I, I don't know anything about lore. <laughs> nothing. Absolutely nothing. How would an extended Katarin and Mother Ostenka interaction go? I don't know. Um, that would be a fascinating conversation to, I think, bring up with Andy Law on this Sunday for our episode of Lorebeards, because I think that would be a fun thing for us to talk about. Um, because I, I think there could be a lot of fun in talking about what that may look like. Uh, because I think Katarin, I think Katarin and Boris would both be able to have a conversation with Mother Ostankia. Um, Kostaltin? No. Kostaltin, Kostaltin would stop at nothing to try and kill Mother Ostankia. He would literally, Kostaltin would do everything in his power to destroy her. That is like his ultimate mission. So when Asvar Kul was invading Kislev, what do you think Mother Ostankia was doing? She didn't exist yet. So there's not an answer to that question. <laughs> I, I, I can't answer that because she literally didn't exist. Um, I am looking forward to the new lore because, or for the old world, because we know that she's going to be a character. So when Kislev eventually gets an army book, so hopefully she'll be a playable character and we'll get to actually see what she does. Uh, 
I feel like the Kislev faction mechanics are a big wield with Ostenka. She doesn't seem like a character who would get involved in the power struggle. She's not involved in the power struggle, though, Savinsky. Um, Ostenka does not have access to the, the power struggle for Kislev. She has a unique mechanics. She, she has, she, if you are playing a Mother Ostenka campaign, you do not give a fuck about the throwdown between the Ice Court and the Great Orthodoxy. Does anyone know if there's a, is there a, any point to playing the new characters in Runs of Chaos over uh, Immortal Empires? Generally speaking, um, Realm of Chaos campaigns are usually a little faster. Um, depending on like how you play, um, usually they're a little quicker. Um, but nah, not really. Because th this is the first time we've had DLC characters where their storyline shows up in both Realms of Chaos and Immortal Empires. It used to be that... So before... Um, Shadows of Change, it used to be that if you played Immortal Empires, it was purely a sandbox that just didn't have any story. Um, so if you wanted the story, like you wanted the cutscenes and you wanted the like all the little story objectives and all that other stuff, you had to go play the Realms of Chaos or Realms of Chaos equivalent, right? Realms of Chaos or the Vortex campaign or the Warhammer 1 campaign, whatever. Um, but uh, now with Shadows of Change, that's actually different. Um, that's no longer the case, which is very unique. It's entirely unsupported, but I'd love to have some minor elementals of Gur for Ostenkia and the Beastmen. So, if you want to get technical, Bouncy Snake, if you want to get really technical, there are minor elementals of Beasts in Ostenkia's faction. Well, actually, just Kislev in general. The way you get them is that if you take a beast hag witch, you get the ability to summon a unit of things in the wood, but they're all like weird looking, like they're like really like spacey, crazy looking. And it's because they're literally spirits of Gur. Um, like they're, they're, they're like minor elementals of Gur, essentially. When is Thrones of Decay coming out? Probably April. I think Dreicha should have access, access to Bale Wolves. I don't know if I would agree with that. Um, I, I see the argument, but Bale Wolves to me do not necessarily feel like natural creatures of the forest, which is Dreicha's shtick. They feel more like entities that are really nasty and unnatural that Ostenkia has managed to bind to her. I don't know if they are something... I, I, I'm I, not sure if they would be considered something that Dreicha would actually utilize. Is that the new lore for things in the woods? No, 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 no. Not for all things in the woods. Not, not for all of the things in the woods. Just the beast summon. The regular things in the woods are like... They're flesh and blood. Like they're, they're actual physical creatures. When you use the summon from your beast hag witch... You are summoning something that looks like uh, and acts like things in the woods, but they're not things in the woods. They're spirits. I, I forget what their name is. They're like, Dru uh, Dru it starts with a D. Drycha also has manticores, though. Yeah, but manticores are like a pretty common sight in a lot of parts of the world. Like they're a pretty common feral creature to find in like the mountains and the forest and all the stuff. The things in the woods seem like they're very, very rare. Like exceptionally rare. Why no giant wolves for Ostankia? Um, the actual answer to that question is that they would not add anything to her roster most likely. Um, but like if she has giant spiders and she has bears, there's really no reason she wouldn't have wolves. Um, most likely it's just that she does not require them for her roster. They're no longer chaos aligned. I don't know if I would have said that the, the bale wolves or the things in the wood were ever truly chaos aligned. Cause you have to understand that chaos aligned is a very fuck. It's a very, very messy terminology where anything that is not natural, right? Anything that's not natural. So, oh, uh, Godzilla, I will get around to that in just a second, my dude. Uh, thank you. Um, but so like 
there, there's a huge spectrum of creatures of chaos. Um, it is a very fucking nebulous term where all of the creatures that are not the creatures from our world, right, are technically creatures of chaos. So like griffins, manticores, hippogriffs, pegasi, um, certain species of dragons, demigriffs, those are all technically chaos creatures. They are creatures that were created when chaos came into the world. But would you say that they're chaos aligned? Like it, like, no, probably not. The things in the woods and the, or the Beowulves are the exact same. They were initially created by chaos, right? Chaos causing mutation and for things to uh, uh, alter and to grow in unnatural and grotesque ways. But then when they left, like Mordheim, for instance, when they fled from the ruins of Mordheim and moved up north through the forest and eventually apparently made their ways to uh, made their way to Kislev, they stabilized as a species. Um, they became something that, while looking horrifically unnatural, seem to have enough numbers that they are somehow able to keep going. Whether that's because they are able to procreate, maybe, or maybe because if they're sticking with the old Mordheim lore, if they bite you, um, their bite carries an infection that will turn you into a Beowulf, which is fucking horrifying. Um, but either way, that does not make them chaos aligned creatures that would not make them creatures of chaos in the sense that I would not say they belong in a chaos roster. They are very spooky, creepy ass monsters, creatures. Yes, they're awful. They're unnatural. They're flat out mutated, but are they chaos creatures? Well, according to this new lore, no, they're not. They have become very integrated into the dark forest. They are drawn to dark forests that are horrible and full of nasty monsters and creatures that are not chaos aligned, but are very spooky and gross. Are fin beasts from Albion chaos? No, fin beasts are constructs. They are, they are thing. They are, they are like golems created by wizards using, um, materials from fins and swamps. But you could argue that they are chaos beasts because magic is chaos. Magic is inseparable from chaos. They are the same thing. Um, so like in that sense, yeah, they would be chaos beasts, I guess. But once again, I'm trying to demonstrate to you all how fucking nebulous of a term that is. Do I think Ostenka can purify chaos beasts? No, I do not think that is something she would do. Um, I think Ostenka can bind things to her. Uh, I think she can control things. I do not think she would purify anything. That does not seem to be her MO. Are there other examples of chaos slash magic mutated creatures that don't align with chaos? Uh, yes. Once again, hippogriffs, demigriffs, um, but like a really fucked up looking creature. Oh, uh, let's see. What's a good example of a super messed up looking creature that is not that you would not ever see in a chaos horde that wants nothing to do with chaos, but is mutated. Um, good examples would be. Hmm. What would be like the best example? There are various kinds of squigs that serve as good examples. There are some horrifically mutated squigs out there, but they're just squigs. Um, uh, yetis. Yetis are a perfect example. Um, yetis are literally ogres that decided to stay in the ancient giant lands along the peaks where they were exposed to copious amounts of warpstone dust and it mutated them into a completely new race, which are called yetis, and they have nothing to do with chaos. They don't worship chaos gods. They don't work with chaos. Instead, they honor their ancient packs with the ogres um, and work alongside them. 
the Great Maw is another example of an entity that was created by Warpstone and a purely chaosy things, but is also not chaos. Um, anything that has to do with the undead, undead are created by magic, which is a chaos material, which is chaos, and yet they are not chaos aligned. Um, Morngulls. Uh, Morngulls are an excellent, uh, an excellent um, example. Where you have Morngulls are naturally occurring creatures. Well, unnaturally occurring creatures. They are people who, uh, when uh, high up in the mountains and caught in horrible blizzards and frost storms and isolation and hunger, resort to cannibalism, which causes them to draw in uh, magic into themselves and it mutates them into horrible undead abominations. Are unicorns chaos? I mean, they're magical creatures, so you could argue that they're chaos. But once again, messy. All right, let's see what all these super chats are about. Uh, Godzilla, I don't mean to go off topic, but there's a legendary hero salamander mod in honor of the creator's pet leopard gecko that passed away. I am sorry to hear that that individual's uh, pet leopard gecko passed away. That's very, very cool that they made a mod for it. That is very neat. I mean, I don't really have anything to contribute to that. Just, it's neat. No, no, there are some genuinely mutated squigs. Like, there are there are types of squigs. They're not like a full-on, like, species of squigs. But there are squigs that have been, like, so horribly mutated that they have, like, multiple heads or multiple faces because they have hung around Warpstone for too long. I thought I read somewhere griffins are considered creatures created by chaos since they were a mutation and not naturally occurring. Yes, that is what I said. At least twice <laughs> in the last 10 minutes. What Nurgle Lord do I think it's going to come with Thrones of Decay? I would be willing to bet a grotesque amount of money it's Tarmacon. Because calling it Thrones of Decay literally smacks of Tarmacon. Because Tarmacon was the only character that was released for a series that was meant to be a quadrilogy um, that was called The Thrones of Chaos. Um, where each of Tarmacon and his siblings were attempting to acquire a throne, but I'm pretty sure all of them fail. Unrelated, but we could we see Bestial Greater Demons of Corn and Slash based on the pre-end times models. Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, I, I don't think there's going to be any more Greater Demon models because they have, I think they have filled the roles that they are. Like, you might see some Regiment of Renown ones, but I don't, I don't think they're going to use their older designs. Hammond, I, I'm, yes, Hammond, I'm aware that you also informed me about the dead pet mod. That is, that is the second time today people have told me about it. My heart goes out to that guy. It always sucks when your pets die. It's one of the most it's one of the most horrible things about life is when you're is when you outlive your loved ones, whether they be pets or humans or whatever. If I were a consultant on ad, to advance the Lisbon lore with new units, what would I recommend? Okay, when you say when you say advance the lore, do you mean like completely brand new units that have never been created or seen before? Or do you mean adding units that already exist in the lore. Tarmacon or T Tomarcon, uh, whatever. <laughs> Listen, don't come to me for pronunciations. You're going to have a bad time. Can we see Tarmacon's brothers later until World War Hammer? I really doubt it. I really doubt it. Um, all of the other Chaos factions have a shitload of characters that everybody wants to see already. And the only way we would be able to get Tarmacon's brothers is that Games Workshop would have to give the okay for games for Creative Assembly to go dig up a discontinued Forge World series. Um, which I don't think Games Workshop would want them to do. Especially not right now, because there's a lot of very, 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 very reliable information coming out that the Games Workshop studio and the Forge World studio are having a big bitch fight. Um, and they're both acting like toddlers and being really not cool to each other. Um, which has led to a lot of really nasty things going on. 
Um, so I don't think Games Workshop is going to want to do anything that involves Forge World that's not already published. Isn't the corn book already made? Uh, does it exist in a file somewhere? Sure. Has it ever been seen by anyone outside of Forge World or Games Workshop? No. I mean, supposedly, um, here supposedly this model so this is Vorgoroth the Scarred and Skalik the Skull Host of Corn. Uh, supposedly this model, this like giant fucking chaos dragon of corn with a big old guy on its, uh, with a warrior on its back. Supposedly this was supposed to be Tarmacon's brother. So this was supposed to be the, um, this is supposed to be the Cornate brother because it is a Forge World model. So it was created by Forge World, but it was never released for Warhammer Fantasy. Um, I think it got released for Age of Sigmar. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, um, you know, supposedly this is one of his brothers and was going to be the next book. Uh, yes, there was a brother for each god. That's talked about in the Tarmacon book. If you read the Tarmacon book, um, in the opening segments when it's explaining who Tarmacon is, it talks about that there were four brothers and each of the dark gods claims one of the brothers. And there's a prophecy that they are going after what's known as the throne of chaos and that one of them will claim it. Um, one of them may claim it. And if they do so, they'll like ascend to some kind of godhood or some shit. Um, and so the idea was that there is a Zinch brother, a Nurgle brother, a Corn brother, and a Slanesh brother. And Tarmacon is the first one we got to see. And there were supposed to be three others. And supposedly we're, we're going to get to follow. The, no, they're brothers very specifically. Um, but we were supposed to see them invade different parts of the world. So like Tarmacom was going to invade the empire. And then the corn brother would invade like, I don't know, Nagaroth or something. And then maybe the Slanesh brother would invade Lustria or the Southlands. And the, the Zinch brother would invade Cathay. Something like that. Um... But obviously we never got to see that happen because the end times happened and they fucking shot Forge World in the back of the head. Jack Flanagan, thank you for the very generous super chat. Thank you so much, dude. Hey, Sotek, if it's all right, I'd like to ask an off-topic question. Yeah, sure. For, for money, I'll, <laughs> I will gladly go off-topic for money. Um... About the most recent Lordbeards episode, if Malagor's goal is to tear down religion, then would Grand Cathay be a very hard enemy for him since they're secular? No. Um, and the reason for that is that while the dragons, the Cathayan dragons, do not like gods, right? They they talk shit about gods. They hate gods. Um, they they very strongly push the people of Cathay to be secular. The people of Cathay are not actually secular. Um, many of them, they are supposed to be, but many of them um, do worship the dragons or they worship, they do ancestor worship. Ancestor worship is very, very popular in Grand Cathay. Um, and there is likely many people in Cathay that worship local gods. So like spirits of the rivers or the lakes or the land or the forest or the mountain. Um, which are spirits that the dragons would very, very much want to suppress. Um, but the people of Cathay, you know, they were probably, wor they've been worshiping these entities for thousands of years. Um, and maybe in places where the dragon's power is not as strong, they fall back on these old habits. That being said, Malagor would see things like the Great Bastion as a religious symbol. It is a symbol of civilization. It is a symbol of the arrogance of entities that are godlike, inflicting their will upon the world and changing the world to suit their desires. 
in order to make things better in their eyes. They are altering the natural state of the world, right? And so that means that Malagor would fucking hate Grand Cathay. Uh, Malagor would want nothing more than to tear down um, the Great Bastion. Can't hear me? Uh, well, my mic says it's still going, so you should be able to hear me. I think it's just you, Pollux. <laughs> um, Hammond, did Mr. Gorbachev tear down this wall? Somebody tore it down in the end times, um, though we don't know who. But no, I, I think Malagor would actually be a... <laughs> sorry, my bad, I muted myself. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I... Yeah, Malagor, while Malagor's... You have to remember that Malagor we get to see from an Empire perspective. So because we see him from an Empire perspective, it's all kind of... Th it's all very focused on like gods, 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 gods. Because the polytheism of the Empire is a very core component of what it is to be part of the empire. You know, Magnus the Pious, his famous phrase is the empire lives on faith, steel, and gunpowder, right? Um, whereas if you, if Malagor were to wind up in Grand Cathay for some reason, um, it would be less about the gods and it would be more about what the dragons are doing, how they are imposing harmony on the world um, I think Malagor would find the concept of harmony to be extremely irritating um, and to be something that he would want to demonstrably tear down. Like Malagor would be that guy that would show up in a Cathayan village and he would be using his sorcery to very deliberately force them towards disharmony to basically be making a point of this is the natural state of things. This is the way the world is meant to be. This is the correct way of things. This is, you know, I am here to tear down these usurpers, these dragons who are trying to force the world into a different image. Um, and here's why they're wrong. Also, by the way, I'm going to murder all you blah, 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 Malagor stuff. Someone brought down the bash in the end times. Apparently, uh, who would be your biggest suspects? Uh, biggest suspects would probably be like Galrach. Colex Sun Eater. Um, uh, who else didn't show up in the end times? Uh, I think those are like the two biggest bad boys that don't actually make an appearance. Um, probably maybe some betrayal from within Cathay itself. Maybe some green skins. Maybe some ogres. Maybe the Chaos Dwarfs. Maybe the Hobgobliconate. You know, any of them could have probably pulled it off in an end time scenario. Are there any monotheistic religions in Warhammer? Uh, religions? Yes. Cultures? Not really. Um, I don't think there's any monotheistic cultures. Uh, uh yeah, the Skaven, actually. The Skaven are a monotheistic culture because they worship the Great Horn Rat, period. Necromancer Cobalt, thank you for the super chat very much. If they wanted to give Malagor an extra enemy who isn't his normal ones, it would be the Chaos Dwarves, if I interpreted your stream correctly. He would certainly fucking hate them. Uh, that's why, like, that's why I would very much love to see Malagor in Grand Cathay, because then you could have Malagor kind of dealing with Grand Cathay and the Chaos Dwarfs. Um, like, he would be very, very good enemies for both of those. Uh, yeah, the Chaos Dwarves are also monotheistic. Yes. Yep, 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 yep. So yeah, Chaos Dwarves and Skaven um i would say are monotheistic would the maw count no actually because the ogres do worship other gods um like the 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 fire the the fire mouth um the fire mouth which is the big fucking volcano that the fire bellies come from is considered a god um in ogre culture all right my dudes, uh, this has been very fun. I, I hope you all enjoy chatting about the story and doing kind of the breakdown and everything. Um, uh, we are going to be definitely going over a lot of this again on Sunday with Andy Law um, for this week's episode of Lorebeards, which just a reminder is going to be on the Lawhammer YouTube and Twitch channels. So if you haven't already, make sure you're following him on Twitch or subscribe to him on YouTube. That way you'll know when the stream goes live. Um, Oh yeah, Kraken Rock the Black. Yeah, Kraken Rock the Black would have been perfect for destroying the Great Bastion. 
Um, he would have been, that would have been the perfect guy to throw at it. Um, but, um, I hope you all will join us uh, on Sunday. Also a reminder that tomorrow, uh, at least if you're American tomorrow, if you are in Europe, it is already the day of, but uh, at 6 p.m. Present. Present. At 6 p.m. Central Standard Time, uh, midnight. So not midnight tonight, but next midnight, uh, BST. Um. On my channel, we are going to be doing the Who Would Win, the first episode of the new Who Would Win series. Hopefully, it doesn't suck. <laughs> um, I'm kind of nervous about it. I, I hope y'all will really enjoy it. It's, it's going to be interesting to see if it works. We're going to try and have some really fun audience participation things. That way, y'all can be like included in it. Um, and it's going to be interesting trying to do a nerd argument with, uh, with Andy. Um, and see how we try to manage not just talking over each other the entire time. But um, yes, it's going to start in, uh, let's see, 12, about, let's see, if I did 12 hours from now would be about 11 a.m. and then noon, one, two, three, four, five, six. So roughly 17 hours from now, roughly 17 hours from now, um, I believe is when the, uh, nope, that's not right. Wait, is that right? 12? No, that's wrong. 19 hours, roughly 19 hours from now. <laughs> yeah. Roughly 19 hours from right now is when the who would win episode will start. Giotto, thank you so much for the super chat. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. All right, my dudes. Well, I'm going to get out of here. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed the stream and had a good time with it and uh, enjoyed it. If you're on Twitch, I'm gonna send you on a raid to a buddy of mine. Uh, and if you're on YouTube, uh, bye, I guess. <laughs> so um, I will see you guys later. I've gotta go get ready for some stuff tomorrow, uh, which is very exciting. A lot of really cool things about to happen. Um, and I will see you all tomorrow. Trust me, I will see you tomorrow. Uh, so <laughs> hope you all have a good day. Uh, I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you.